Thanks for joining us today. Apologies for the technical difficulties getting started. This afternoon joining us, we have Milwaukee Mayor Tom Barrett, Dr. Ben Weston, Director of Medical Services for the Office of Emergency Management, Darren Rausch, Health Officer and Director of the Greenfield Health Department, and Greg Lewis, Pastor of St. Gabriel Church of God in Christ and Executive Director of Souls to the Poles, Milwaukee. Now I'll turn it over to Mayor Barrett. Thank you very much, Sydney. And as we all know that since this pandemic began, it's had a huge impact on the health of millions of Americans, um, but it's also had a tremendous impact on the financial health of many Americans and the financial health of many small businesses. We were fortunate earlier this year when Congress was able to act on a bipartisan fashion uh, to bring forth the CARES Act, which provided over $100 million to the city of Milwaukee, and I'm gonna to touch on that in a moment. Uh, we also know that this week, uh, Congress and Speaker is negotiating with the White House in particular about a second act that would help many, many businesses, um, including I think the airlines industry, certainly the hotel industry, uh, universities have been in the conversation, um, local units of government. Um, we have been severely impacted by this, and it's my sincere hope that um, we're able to fashion a bipartisan package coming out of Washington, D.C. to help us in the next, the next few days, because otherwise I think you're going to see even more negative impacts on our economy. Um, a lot of the attention has been on those large industries, but what we have focused on here at the local level has been the small businesses, um, those businesses that employ 20 or fewer people uh, and have annual revenues of $2 million or less. And we were able earlier this year, fortunately, to utilize some of that CARES Act dollars to help us create a, what we call our restart program. Again, which is geared towards businesses that are 20 or fewer employees with $2 million or less in revenue per year, recognizing that these businesses um, have taken a very, very severe hit. Um, and when we had the first round of restart grants earlier this year, we were able to allocate approximately $4 million to businesses throughout Milwaukee that had had an impact, a negative impact because of COVID. Um, I was very pleased to see that businesses throughout the entire city, not located in one part of the city, but literally in every aldermanic district were able to take advantage of that. Um, and because of that, we have made the decision to have a second round of our Restart Grant program. Uh, this, this round will have up to $10 million that will be available to local businesses. And beginning today, through next Thursday, you will be able to apply for grants from this program. And if you took part in, if you took part in the first round of the Restart program, um, you can apply again. Uh, we're also encouraging new categories of businesses, businesses that were not included in the first round, including home-based businesses, food trucks, licensed daycares, and state licensed group homes to take advantage of this program. Again, you can apply online at Milwaukee, dot gov slash restart beginning today, October 1st. The application deadline will continue through October 8th. So it's gonna be a, a, a relatively short window. It is not first come first serve. What we will do is we will see how many applications we have by the end of next week. Um, and then we will make the allocations based on that. So again, for small businesses located in the city of Milwaukee, I encourage you to go to that website and to see if this is a program that would benefit you. Um, as we've talked about, in the past couple of days, past couple of weeks, there will be changes coming in the coming weeks um, pertaining to our National Guard testing sites. I'm immensely grateful to Governor Evers and to the National Guard for their partnership, but we know that the outbreaks that are occurring right now are significant in other parts of the state. In fact, at the beginning of this pandemic, um, a lot of the attention was paid, rightfully so, to Milwaukee because we were a, a significant percentage of the cases in the state of Wisconsin. Now, if you were to take a look at all 72 counties, what you would see is you would see three of the largest, if not the three largest counties in the state, Waukesha, Milwaukee, and Dane, all hovering around 49, 50, 51 in terms of our incidence per capita. In other words, um, this COVID-19 pandemic has spread throughout the state of Wisconsin. Um, and I would say it has spread like a wildfire because if you look at the national reports, and I just saw one today that said that Wisconsin unfortunately leads the nation in its dramatic growth in COVID-19 cases. So we are not only not out of the woods, 
um, the woods are on fire right now in terms of what we're seeing throughout the state of Wisconsin. I am pleased that our numbers, relatively speaking, um, are lower than many, many different parts of the state. And I attribute a lot of that to the fact that we're seeing really, really good compliance with individuals on the social distancing. We're seeing really, really good compliance from businesses. We're seeing individuals who, from my standpoint, in a very patriotic way, in a very health conscious and health responsible way, are adhering to our, health, our face mask ordinance. Um, we think that that's very, very important. And, and although the numbers, and Dr. Weston will go into this, the numbers are higher than we want them to be, um, particularly with the outbreaks that we are seeing on the east side, uh, near Marquette, down, down on the south side of the city of Milwaukee, um, those numbers are much higher than we would like them to be. Uh, but again, if you look at the rest of the state, relatively speaking, we are doing well. But relatively speaking, our state is not doing well. Um, and it's actually, I think, a sad commentary that next Monday, I think it's next Monday or Tuesday, before the Wisconsin Supreme Court, the challenge will be heard as to whether the state is going to continue the mask policy at all. So at a time when we need to have the state as our partner, the governor has stepped forward, but I think as people are aware, the legislature has not met, I believe, since this pandemic began. Um, it hasn't met at all since March, um, and yet here we are now faced with uh, the prospect of continuing to be one of the states, if not the state, which, with the largest outbreaks occurring in the United States. Um, we are seeing people get tested, and I think that that's important, and it's good that people are utilizing the sites that we have available. Um, not only the National Guard sites, but the community sites that are there. Um, we like to see people get tested. Um, it is certainly challenging our tracing ability, um, but we're working, we're working on that in the health department, which has been really, really challenged throughout this, is continuing to do excellent work in trying to keep up with that. But yesterday at, at our two sites, we saw 1,047 people at the Yuma site. On the south side, we saw 573 people at Custer on the north side. That means for the week, we've, we've seen nearly 5,000 people already for testing. Um, but again, as we know, the COVID-19 cases have been rising around the state. Um, and we've also seen the cases rising here in our own community. For those of you who don't know someone who has been affected, you, you actually are pretty lucky um, because with the, the rise in cases, I think more and more people are, are having relatives or neighbors or friends or associates um, who have been affected by this. So, so please, um, please make sure that you're, you're caring for those who, loved ones who have been, who, who are suffering from this disease. Um, we're, we're joined today by Pastor Greg Lewis, um, who was one of the early patients, if you will, one of the early victims of this horrendous pandemic, and it's great to see him back. Um, I'm happy to see his beard is as white as ever. Um, so it tells you he's taken nourishment, which is what we, we like to see. But I, I think that we'll be able to hear from him, and he'll share his story of recovering from COVID-19. And again, as we know from the, the national stories, um, even the recoveries are, are sporadic. Some people recover 100%, some people have lingering effects. Um, and we hope Pastor Lewis is, is, is doing everything he can and is recovering 100%. But it is important that we take the time to seriously listen to those who have experienced COVID-19 firsthand. We must remember that in order to protect ourselves and protect others, we must remain vigilant. And that means social distancing, that means practicing proper hygiene and wearing masks. The success we've had here locally in reducing cases is because we've been vigilant and we need to continue forward in that same way. So with that, I'll turn it over to, back over to you, Sydney. Thank you, Mayor Barrett. Now we'll hear from Dr. Ben Weston. All right, thanks, Sydney. Good afternoon. So first to our numbers, we've had 29,369 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our community and 432 individuals who died. In Milwaukee County, we changed from yellow back over to red uh, or an area of high concern in our key metric for cases today, as our percent positive is once again climbing, now reaching a seven day average of 7%. While the rest of the state is seeing a dramatic rise in COVID patients hospitalized, nearly 700 patients and certainly stretching the limits and capacities of many hospital systems, here in Milwaukee County, we've seen a rise in hospitalized patients up from about 70 two weeks ago to 120 or so today, which has been stable so far this week. 
We here in Milwaukee County have the benefit of large hospital systems that are working extremely closely together to ensure adequate surge space for patients in need. <clears throat> that said, no hospital system can absorb an uncontrolled surge. So physical distancing, mask wearing, and testing when needed remains vitally important. Many have asked why Wisconsin is seeing such a peak right now and why at this moment. What's unique about our state that has caused such a surge? To be sure, no one can answer that question definitively, but we can use the evidence we have to make our best estimation of the factors leading to the current increase. Our current surge in Wisconsin appears to be in the setting of somewhat of a perfect storm of factors. We saw our initial clusters several weeks ago, primarily in colleges and universities, where despite any institutional precautions in place, physical distancing often goes out the door during extracurricular social activities. However, to be sure, this has transitioned to community spread now, rather than just isolated in college or universities. And this goes to the discussion that we've had before that none of us live in isolation. We interact with our families, our friends, and all of the essential workers who we see on an often daily basis. Adding to this storm of factors is cooler weather and spending more time indoors, which leads to less safe groupings and easier transmission of the virus. Finally, we see nationally a seeming cycle of lower levels of disease leading to more complacency and a decrease in both personal as well as institutional protections against transmissions demonstrated through higher case numbers, which eventually leads to a retightening of precautions. And this cycle, so first a low burden of disease leading to loosening of restrictions, then higher transmissions, tightening back up of restrictions, and then back to lower levels of disease has continued in different regions across the country. But it's important to remember that with each cycle, people are affected and lives are lost. Each of these factors, as well as potential initial transmission from colleges and universities, continued current spread in all of our communities, colder weather, and a heightened complacency in our state seem to have led us to where we are today. So now that we're here among the, high, the states with the highest rates of COVID, as the mayor outlined, and we're seeing continued concerning trends in cases and hospitalizations in our county as well as our state, and now increased deaths in the state with the highest number yet posted yesterday. We have to really reevaluate our practices. We're once again working to flatten an out of control curve in Wisconsin. That means face masks, physical distancing, and careful moderation and consideration of higher risk activities is gonna be essential to get back to where we were just a few weeks ago. Thank you very much, stay safe, and I will hand it over to the Greenfield Health Director, uh, Director Rausch. Thank you very much, Dr. Weston, and it's my pleasure to join today from the Greenfield Health Department to talk about the data that we're seeing here in Milwaukee County as it relates to COVID-19. Go ahead and share my screen if possible. It's not allowing sharing, Sydney. Try now. Thank you. So in light of the conversation that both Mayor Barrett and, and Dr. Weston already had in terms of increasing COVID rates, kind of leading the nation in some categories um, with COVID in Wisconsin, I wanted to start with this uh, data graphic today. There's a large narrative that COVID is out of control in the state, in many parts of the state. Many of my colleagues in other parts of the state, particularly the northeast part of the state, Fox Valley, Green Bay area, are experiencing some of the highest rates of COVID that they've experienced throughout the pandemic. And I just thought it would be important to share kind of what, how we look in terms of Milwaukee compared to um, a percentage of all the overall cases in, in Wisconsin. So you can see in the early months what was happening in Wisconsin, in the, or in Milwaukee, excuse me, in the orange. And then we've reflected here in the data report, Waukesha, Ozaukee, and Washington in the bluish color and then the rest of the state in the gray. And really the message here is you can see in the early months, what was happening in Milwaukee County and the broader Southeastern region was really driving the cases throughout the state. But you can see really starting in, you know, June and July, that started to, to differentiate quite a bit. And so we see 
growing cases of COVID-19 throughout the state of Wisconsin through the summer months and into the fall where we are now. And so while our numbers, as you'll see on our weekly report, are still below some of our maximums, as you see here on the screen from historical times, we had a recent peak in July and our data is approaching that. So we need to be very careful with the decisions we're making and the collective actions we're making in the next few weeks because we could be very rapidly in both the city of Milwaukee and in the suburbs reaching levels that we haven't seen since July. So it is particularly alarming and we are watching this data very closely. A Couple other things just to highlight this week. Um, death data has always been a lagging indicator. We have seen a greater number of reports of deaths both in the state and across the country. Um, largely, we have been pretty consistent in Milwaukee County since early July. We've been tracking a number of demographic variables. We've talked about those recently as well, and we've also been tracking the reproductive number. I highlighted last week that our reproductive number was growing. You can see the reproductive value for the county is almost 1.1, a little bit higher, 1.09 in the city and 0.95 in the suburbs. So this transmission number is very important because it indicates how many people are getting COVID from that one confirmed case. And you can see really since the early part of September, we've seen a significant increase in our transmission rate, approaching 1.5 at times, but right now settling around 1.1. This is the trend that we see in the county. And if I scroll down and shrink my screen a little bit, you can see that there's a significant different trend in the city of Milwaukee versus the Milwaukee County suburbs. So we see a more sustained, sustained spike in the city, which also correlates with higher case counts and higher case rates in the city of Milwaukee at the current time. We've been tracking the demographics. We flagged several things for you last week. We continue to message on the fact that while there is a narrative that 18 to 24 year olds are driving case rates in many parts of the state, that is not the story here in Milwaukee County yet although their case rates are rising. So currently the 25 to 39 year old population has the most cases in Milwaukee County. They also have the highest case rate, but right on their heels in terms of growth rate is the young adult population 18 to 24. I'm going to leave today, um, move next to talk about testing because that's an important thing that we've talked about in the past for many, many weeks, we have been down. We've been looking at decreasing rates of testing. And I'm happy to report that we are up slightly in the last several weeks. So after many, many weeks of downward trends, it's good to report the last three weeks have been higher than usual, but still we're not using all of our testing capacity. So I remind everyone, tests are available. Please access testing if you're concerned about COVID-19 for yourself, for a loved one if you have symptoms, or if you just wanna get checked out because you're concerned that you may have been exposed and you wanna know your disease status. So testing is up slightly. The 14-day trends are relatively flat and not statistically significant, and we continue to monitor those very, very closely. And then lastly, I'll leave you with just our look of our spatial maps, where COVID is occurring, who's getting tested, because these are some important factors to consider. This particular map shows you all of the COVID cases over the last seven months. We have activity really throughout the county. When we look at the last week, the narrative is very similar to what it has been the week before. We have a lot of cases on the south side of Milwaukee through um, the east side, but we also have other pockets of disease um, in our suburban communities, both north and south, um, that are indicative here on the map. Another spatial map that's been in this report, and we'll make sure that if you need it, you can get this report, is the testing rate. This is the testing rate throughout the pandemic from March through September. And then this has been the testing rate within the past week. And what this continues to show us is for a second consecutive week, we do not have testing it largely in many areas throughout Milwaukee County, but I'll certainly flag many areas of the city of Milwaukee are under tested. And we know many of the areas in the yellow throughout the suburban communities are also under tested. So again, I urge everybody who needs testing 
to access that testing, and that's why I really wanted to share these maps today. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts on COVID-19. The COVID data indicates that disease cases continue to increase significantly. We continue to see cases climb. While we're not at the peak that we've seen um, both in the spring and the summer, we are concerned that we may get there. With the larger growth in cases most recently amongst those 25 to 39, our narrative doesn't center on college age adults, but centers on a lot of people who are parents of college age adults or parents of school children. And that transmission can go from parent to child into the school or university setting. And we need to continue to watch that closely. Secondarily, while our cases in Milwaukee County are increasing, COVID-19 is surging even more in other parts of the state. There are many parts of the state that have much higher rates than Milwaukee County at this point. And so I wanna to continue to point out that COVID is a risk no matter where you are, both in Milwaukee County and across the state of Wisconsin. The state of Wisconsin today reported very high numbers, almost 2,900 cases today alone which continues to signify a continued surge of cases statewide. We are approaching the cases, the high rates that we have seen, but we're not there yet, and that means there's still time for action. As we've talked before, our collective actions directly influence our COVID-19 case rates two weeks from now. The case activity and the disease burden we're seeing today is based directly on decisions we made, attending parties, going to gatherings, um, doing other things that where we may not have been watching our distance and wearing our masks and all of those important factors. So I urge you all to please continue to do what you can do to limit the spread of COVID-19 around Milwaukee County and throughout the state. Wear a mask, watch your distance, and wash your hands. And I thank you all for your time and attention. I'll now turn the briefing over to Pastor Greg Lewis. All right, thank you. I uh, just want to just thank you for having me here today. I want to uh, especially uh, let folks know that, you know, this voting season is important. And we have an organization called Souls to the Polls. And what we do is we educate and give information to folks about uh, the, uh, the early voting, the registering, the photo ID, uh, the absentee ballots, all those things in community. And we're nonpartisan, so we don't talk about candidates or parties, but we certainly want to drive the voting community to the polls. And our slogan is, we're an army of faith and the power of 100,000 souls to the polls. So, so we, we, we have a, uh, an obligation in our community to make sure that everyone who is able and willing get the information that they need to make sure that they head to those polls, especially for early voting. And during this pandemic season, we want them certainly to get those absentee ballots so they can mail in for the safety of the community. And everyone can't be a, a part of, 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 of this, uh, you know, standing in line on November 3rd. So please get those, those early ballots in. And, you know, we, we do this all by being in touch with about 500 faith leaders in the city. And we ask these faith leaders, to talk to their membership. And we ask the membership to talk to their family and friends and neighbors. And we, we, we ask the neighbors and families and friends to talk to their circles of influence. And that's how we're gonna get our 100,000 souls to the polls. And, and, and after November 3rd, on November 4th, the real work starts because we wanna kind of stay together and build a block of voters who are working together to build up power in our community so that we can express ourselves with an agenda that people will listen to. You know, I, I had the, the COVID-19 and, and I, I certainly am fortunate to be here. I had the, I had bronchitis, I had pneumonia, I had a lung infection, I'm diabetic and the COVID jumped on all of that. And people, uh, the doctors didn't expect me to live. That's how vicious this virus is. And I wish everybody would take it more serious. I wish you would work 
wear your mask, wear gloves, do all of those kind of things to keep yourself and your family safe, especially the older adults. Make sure that you don't just consider what's good for you, but consider what's good for everyone. When you go out and, and you don't wear those masks and if, if you cough or sneeze and one droplet would get inside of me, that could cause me to have a critical condition. So everybody needs to understand that and it's very important that you do. And because uh, we want everybody to get their souls to the polls come November 3rd and especially consider going early to vote between October 20th and November 1st. So, you know, I just want to thank you for having this opportunity to talk about all the things that we're doing with Souls to the Polls. And uh, if, if there's anybody who wants to join us, we're at www.soulstothepollsmke.org. And then after November 3rd, we're at www.buildingablock.com. So everyone, you know, make sure you stay safe and make sure you vote. Thank you. All right, thank you, Pastor Lewis. Our first question is from Hillary Mintz at WISN 12. It's for Dr. Weston. As hospitalizations increase, can we expect the death toll to climb as well? Yeah, so I think we've, we've seen a pattern with COVID where the cases initially come uh, and then we see a rise in hospitalizations. And unfortunately, after that, we end up seeing a rise in deaths. Um, we've started to see a rise in deaths already as a state. Uh, the state of Wisconsin had 27 newly reported deaths yesterday. It's the highest number we've seen on any day, uh, I believe, since COVID started uh, in Wisconsin. So it certainly is a concerning trend. Um, unfortunately, I would say we're probably, uh, with the hospitalizations we're seeing and the trend we're seeing there, uh, I would say, yes, we're probably going to see more deaths. Um, but hopefully we can flatten that curve as far as cases, which will certainly lead to a flattening of hospitalizations uh, and deaths as well. Thanks, Dr. Weston. Our next question comes from Christina Van Zelst at Fox 6 News. You mentioned colder weather having an impact in Wisconsin. Mayor Barrett, what's in the plans for outdoor dining, active streets, as the weather turns from fall to winter? Well, as Are I there allowances for that to continue? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Restart Grant Program, uh, second round begins today, and money from that can be used for outdoor dining. And so I think that that is a place where if restaurants or bars want to use that to get heaters and things like that, uh, it appears that that certainly would be an eligible item. That's maybe the theoretical part because it's probably going to get more difficult for people to find outdoor heaters and outdoor lights for, for patios and things like that as um, I can attest from looking for it at my home, finding an outdoor heater for our just for our backyard patio. There's a lot of demand for them right now. But I think the real test is going to be when does winter come? And, and we're a hearty group here in Wisconsin. And I think people will continue to go to restaurants and eat outdoors um, until they can. But certainly look at that Restart Grant Program between now and next week to see if this is a place where you want to invest some money to make that period last even longer. So hopefully we can get it through November. Um, I can't make any promises for December, January, and February. Our next question is from Sharon Bagenda at CBS 58. This is for Mayor Barrett, Dr. Weston, and Director Rausch. What are some of the disadvantages with cold weather and COVID-19? Is there a fear of people gathering indoors versus outdoors? How does that affect ventilation and what is your advice? Will there be an expected increase in mental health crisis calls when more people are isolated inside? I think Dr. Weston is, he's the person who knows that the best and, and maybe Director Rausch, but I certainly have opinions, but let's listen to the experts. Sure, so I think the cold weather uh, coming is very concerning. I think that's one of the most concerning things on the horizon right now uh, in any states where it's getting colder. We know uh, intuitively when it's colder out, we're probably all noticing it already. We're outside less, we're inside more, uh, and in, we want to gather with other people. And so there's a much higher uh, incidents of gathering together indoors. Uh, and we know that the virus, uh, number one, is much more easy to transmit indoors because it's not open air. The virus isn't blowing around and uh, getting circulated out of your airspace. Um, there is some evidence that much like influenza, the virus, the actual virus particles are easier to transmit in colder, drier air. 
Um, we've seen that with flu, uh, and some studies are showing that it's similar with coronavirus. So uh, there's a lot of factors that certainly make the cold air um, much more dangerous for, for COVID as we go into fall and then winter season. As far as the mental health issues, absolutely. Um, we've seen mental health issues uh, throughout the pandemic. Every single month we've been in the pandemic, we've had uh, an increased number of calls and instances of mental health uh, issues, suicide attempts, uh, overdose attempts. Um, it is, does not appear to be slowing down, unfortunately. And we know that in the winter, it, it's harder to get out and socialize. It's harder to be around other people. So it's something to be much more aware of, uh, even more aware than we've been already. Yeah, I think everything Dr. Weston said was absolutely on point. I think we got to remember that even though we're hardy souls in, in Wisconsin and the upper Midwest, the worsening weather has to force us indoors. And it's not that the virus is more virulent during the cold weather. It's just that we are going to end up changing our behaviors and those behaviors are going to um, in some cases, if we continue to meet in groups, but we move into the house or we move into the garage, there certainly adds closeness and a higher level of disease transmission to that mix as we enter the cold weather season. Our next question is from Mark Stevens at CBS 58 for Dr. Weston. Should college students who test positive remain on campus rather than go home? Just to clarify your earlier comments, were they the seed to the current community spread? Yeah, I don't know that we have the evidence right now to say uh, what seeded the current spread. I think there's a number of factors uh, that we talked about. Uh, as far as whether college students should stay on campus or go home, um, that's probably an individual decision. But I think what's really important is, is to isolate, no matter where you are. And this goes for college students, this goes for grade students, this school students. This goes for anybody in the community. If you have symptoms, if you're waiting on the result of a test, if you've had a, a close contact and exposure, you need to separate yourself from other people um, and you need to figure out what the best way to do that is. Um, obviously, it's harder for some people, uh, depending on your work situation, your family situation, your home situation. Uh, but as much as you can, try to isolate yourself from others uh, until you get those test results, until your symptoms are gone. Um, or until the appropriate amount of time has, has passed. And your health departments can help you to work through that and figure out what the right timeline is for that as well. The next question comes from Patrick Palantonio at WISN 12 for Director Rausch. Why does the 25 to 39 age group have higher case counts than others? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I will um, just take over the screen momentarily to share more precisely that data table. Um, when you get the report later, these are on pages eight and pages nine of the report. But this table tells us some of the story. Um, not only do we see the most cases, almost 9,000 cases in the 25 to 39 year old age group, we also see a, an increased number in the 40 to 59 age group. So that was the group I talked about last week saying it's the adults of kids who, who are in universities, colleges, and who are in elementary and secondary schools that are having the most cases. And, and some of this is challenging because we can't tease out and we don't know enough about why that is, but there are certainly some factors. This population or these population groups may likely be tested more frequently, so we may catch these individuals sooner or secondarily, they might be the population groups that our messages haven't reached, and therefore they're engaging in behaviors that aren't COVID friendly. They're, they're not watching their distance. They're not wearing their mask as much. But certainly when we look at the groups, we know that hospitalizations and deaths are highest in our 80 plus year old population, but yet they have the fewest cases. Um, and we really have to be concerned about any of our population groups, but certainly, those 25 to 49 year olds broadly, or 25 to 39 year olds broadly, and the population group above them because they interact with some seniors. Maybe their parents are in the senior category. Maybe they have children in the schools. And that's going to be certainly uh, paramount to controlling the disease is to make sure that we're controlling the disease in all of our population groups. Here I reflect a little over 5,000 cases in the 18 to 24 year group. You see that reflected here in orange. You see that there has been significant growth in that population. And very shortly, they may surpass 
um, in terms of the rate, the 40 to 59 year old age group. So we need to watch this data closely. We need to make sure we're targeting messages to those populations that are, that are driving cases in order to turn around COVID-19 in our community. Our next question comes from Chuck Kornbach at Wisconsin Public Radio for Dr. Weston. Please talk about the state's 82% listed as recovered. What ongoing health concerns do you have for these folks? Yeah, it's an important question. So when the state is defining people as recovered, there's really three categories they're in. Um, so maybe that their symptoms have resolved. Uh, it may be that they're released from public health isolation or that a certain amount of time, 30 days, has passed since their symptoms or their diagnosis. So uh, while they're in the recovered phase, which is really important, uh, we know and we're still learning a lot about this virus and what sort of long-term effects it can have. Uh, we've seen a lot of folks who have uh, chronic fatigue, who have chronic muscle aches, who continue months out to have loss of smell or taste. Um, we've seen uh, effects of the virus creating blood clots, uh, the virus causing uh, strokes causing heart issues. So we're definitely still learning a lot about this. Uh, and I think that's one of the really concerning things about this virus. So uh, even though we know that 80 some percent of people are recovered, which is great, uh, it's a lot better than the alternative. Um, we know that uh, a lot of those folks are still suffering with symptoms from, from COVID-19. Our next question comes from Patrick Palantonio at WISN 12. Mayor Baird and Dr. Weston, how close are you to opening the State Fair Medical Facility? Will that decision be tied solely to the hospital burden in the Milwaukee area or hospital capacity statewide? Who would be sent to the State Fair facility? COVID patients or other patients to make space for COVID patients at regular hospitals? Dr. Weston, I believe you know the answer. Sure, I can. Sure, I can start there. So uh, the alternative care facility was set up as uh, an insurance policy and overflow uh, for our hospitals. I can say our hospitals in Milwaukee County are, are doing a great job and they have surge space set up. So in addition to the normal beds that they can house floor patients in, they can put intensive care patients in, uh, they can expand that out. They've identified spaces to flex, to create more beds, create more space uh, in a safe way. Now that said, uh, if we needed to, certainly we are lucky. Uh, hopefully we never have to use it, as the mayor said many times, but we are lucky to have the alternative care facility uh, available. As far as uh, that being a state resource and how the state would use it, uh, I, I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of the state. They'd have to comment on that. Our next question comes from Sean Ryan at the Milwaukee Business Journal for Mayor Barrett regarding Restart 2.0. What specific impact do city officials hope it will have on businesses? Is there a type of business or industry the city most aims to support with this program? Again, the, the focus is exclusively on small businesses. Um, we know that a lot of larger businesses were able to take advantage of the federal legislation earlier this year, um, but it's the small Main Street businesses, neighborhood businesses, family-owned businesses uh, that have been negatively impacted that don't have the wherewithal or perhaps don't have the accountants or the lawyers that help them navigate the, the more extensive programs that the federal government was offering. So we felt there was an opportunity here for us to focus our efforts. Again, these are federal dollars, so I wanna give credit where credit's due, but, but to focus those dollars on the local small businesses. So it's for businesses that are 20 or smaller, 20 or fewer employees and $2 million or less in revenue. Aside from that, we actually have expanded the pool of eligible businesses. We had more limitations for the first round, but this round, there are some new businesses that are included like daycare centers and, and um, facilities for, for people with disabilities, um, certainly home-owned businesses, food trucks are now eligible for it. So again, I think it's, it's worth your while to see if you own one of these businesses, one of these small businesses. Um, I don't wanna see businesses going out of business. Um, and I know that there's been tremendous, tremendous economic hardship so we're trying to do our part in keeping these businesses alive. So, so take a look at the criteria. Um, it's pretty straightforward and it's a pretty easy application process. Our next question comes from Meg Jones at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. What are officials doing to induce more people to get seasonal flu shots? And how important is it to get the flu vaccination during this pandemic? 
Well, I can say the health department is going to be offering them here in the city of Milwaukee beginning next week. Um, I've gotten my flu shot. My, my wife has gotten her flu shot. I, I'm a believer in flu shots. I think given the, the challenges that we are going to have going forward, um, I think it's wise to do that, but I'm going to let the, the medical experts talk about why they think it's wise. Yeah, so getting a flu shot this year, uh, every year it's important, uh, and we know that Milwaukee County has lower rates of flu vaccination than uh, the rest of the state, and we know that our underserved populations have even lower rates than that. So uh, this is going to be a particularly important year to get uh, the flu vaccine. We don't know what sort of flu season it's going to be. Uh, we have seen in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, they haven't had a real bad flu season. Looking at past years, though, that's not necessarily predictive of what we have. So hopefully we'll mirror that and we won't have a bad flu season. Um, but considering that COVID is going to continue uh, and is ramping up right now, uh, you certainly don't want to get influenza uh, and COVID at the same time. So please get your flu shot. I know, as Mayor Barrett said, the Milwaukee Health Department's working hard on that. Uh, we have a cross-collaborative work group um, through the city and the county and the municipalities working on access to flu vaccine. Um, so there's a lot of work going on on that front. It looks like we have one more question in chat from Christina Van Zelst at Fox 6 News. With the rest of the state's numbers so high, does that have an impact on Milwaukee's reopening plan? Well, we look at the indicators for Milwaukee and, and we're gonna to continue to follow those. Is it gonna have an impact? Obviously, I think, and I'm concerned about the students. There was an earlier question about students who are away at school, whether they come home. We know that there's a number of universities that are gonna finish their first semester at or around Thanksgiving. So we'll have students coming home then. Um, and I, I don't know for certain, I don't think we're gonna know for certain whether the proliferation of cases that we have seen throughout the rest of the state, state comes from students that have gone to dorms and are coming home. Um, but, but obviously we look at that, but we look at the numbers, the indicators for Milwaukee in de deciding what level we're gonna be at. Then we're gonna continue to do that. And it looks like that's our final question for the, day, for the day. Thank you, Mayor Barrett, Dr. Weston, Do Director Rausch, and Pastor Lewis for answering questions again today. Uh, we'll see everyone back here next Tuesday. Thank you all very much. Thank you.